Assalamu alaikum everyone. Hello and welcome to Diving Deep. And today joining us is Melody Moizi all the way from USA. So I'm joining you here from Karachi in Pakistan and I'm very, very excited that after many months of coordinating this special meeting, we are finally here together to share thoughts and love and fondness about a very, very special person, Rumi. Um, so welcome, Melody. Thank you for joining me. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here with you. So am I. I'm super excited. Um, I hope I can contain my excitement and uh, stick to the conversation we're meant to do here today. Um, so I, I am so excited to have you here because not only am I a fan of Rumi, but also a mental health advocate. And I've been also working with a lot of women. So you are like the complete package. Um, mm -hmm. I, I get to talk about so many things with you, which are so uh, pertinent to my own journey. So uh, uh, just to start out and break the ice, please tell us about your journey into this book, Rumi Prescription. Uh, thank you so much, Fossi John. Um, I appreciate you and uh, all of your watchers, readers, listeners doing this on a uh, different platform for me. Initially, we were supposed to do this on Instagram Live. So I first off want to say really thank you for being able to be flexible on that. Uh, this book is my third book. My first book was about young Muslim Americans. Uh, and that was, I had written about a about a dozen different young Muslim Americans, and that was post 9-11, very much in an attempt to fight Islamophobia uh, in the US and all over the world, but particularly uh, here in the United States. And after that, I wrote a book called Haldol and Hyacinth, which is, was about having bipolar disorder uh, from my own unique cultural and religious perspective. And then more recently was the Rumi prescription. So Haldol and Hyacinth is what I call a bipolar memoir. It's about having bipolar disorder. Uh, the Rumi prescription is sort of the same and the opposite of that in the sense that it's my acknowledgement that those who are so-called sane um, need a lot of help too. Uh, that This idea that there is a sane world and a mad world in terms of the clinical side of things uh, didn't strike me as accurate because uh, the more I investigated mental health, the more I realized that there were incredibly spiritually gifted people uh, within the mental health community, meaning people living with mental health conditions who also were uh, spiritually gifted, not in spite of their mental health conditions, but rather in a lot of cases uh, because of that. Uh, so that was unique to, to me to sort of figure that out and then to also be somebody who believes in science and is, is really adamant that uh, in my experience, I had an acute manic episode and a psychotic break that brought me to Rumi ultimately. Uh, but that acute manic episode and psychotic break was a clinical medical reality that needed treatment. Uh, what preceded it? was a beautiful mystical experience wherein I felt more connected to every living thing than I ever have in my life. Uh, and I wouldn't give that back for a second. Uh, but, you know, most mystics, they prepare for something like that. They prepare for a mystical experience so that they don't get burned by it. Mine, because of my mental health condition, was spontaneous uh, and the result of a whole lot of things, but it being so spontaneous and me not having prepared for it spiritually, uh, I ended up in a place where uh, the clinical realities associated with it overtook the mystical ones. Uh, and I think that happens to a lot of folks. And I just want to be very clear that I believe in both the clinical side and the mystical side. Uh, and I'm not sure these things can be entirely separated. Uh, but they need to be acknowledged. The faith community needs to be better at acknowledging mental health conditions as being medical conditions that need treatment. And the medical community needs to be better at understanding that for some people, these are spiritual gifts that need fostering. Um, and if not fostering, at least understanding. So that's a little bit of the perspective I'm coming from uh, with the Rumi's prescription. Does that answer your question, Fati Jan? This is so exciting for me. Thank you so much for explaining it 
in in this kind of detail and clarity you know because um i think that we need more voices saying this out loud and saying well i had a mystical experience i know it was a mystical experience and i have a uh, you know mental condition that needs uh work that needs you know uh, acknowledgement so i think the biggest reason why we want to open our mouth and voice these uh, you know this this uh, experience is so that others out there who are doubting themselves who are confused who have no idea what's happening to them can come to a place of understanding that it's not abnormal it is part of the human journey it is part of the human phenomena because um it's really sad that we would divorce medicine from the spiritual side while we're we're not just body we know that right because something happens at that where the body remains as it is but something else is gone life is gone so that that is an that is an evidence enough for us to understand look i'm not one dimensional i have so many dimensions and until and unless we don't um you know stitch it all together and come mm-hmm. to a holistic place of understanding we won't be able to find so many answers yeah. so i think that this is a massive step in the right direction thank you so much thank you so much so um you know uh, it it is also something very important what you just said there that the medical community needs to acknowledge the the you know the reality and the uh, you know the importance of faith and faith based experiences um while the faith based communities religious communities need to be acknowledging of the need for clinical analysis of psychological conditions and um giving them the due place in you know inquiry and you know whatever investigations we need to do when it comes to health because if we're mentally doing well everything else will do well right because your brain is taking care of everything else in your body now how have you uh, experienced this coming together you know trying to marry these two together and um how what has been the response from firstly the the religious community how have you seen that happen Uh really it's actually been quite well from people who've had similar experiences. Um and there's a lot of us. There there are many people uh who have dealt with this. I'm very blessed and lucky because I come from a family full of physicians so that when I was diagnosed with bipolar, uh even though that's not a diagnosis that is common in my family, they immediately know knew what that was and they immediately knew this needs medication. and the protocol for it they knew what that was um my best friend from high school happens to be a psychiatrist uh so i was surrounded by this a group of really scientific people some of whom were people of faith some of whom were not uh but they were all my family and they all had really never for a second told me that this was gin for instance <laughs> yes wow yeah uh, yeah so some total strangers uh did want to let me it was hilarious because they would always say sister before telling me it was jen and i'm like i'm not your sister this is not my actual sister has a medical degree and i think i'll listen to my actual sister over you uh <laughs> but it was always somebody saying well sister you know this is probably just jen and you're you need uh in within certain branches of islam as i'm sure you're aware there are things akin to what the westerners would call an exorcism uh that people are familiar with that and it happens with all, a lot within a lot of faith traditions so when i say i'm lucky i'm blessed not just that my family understood that this was a medical condition that needed treatment but also that i was not taken for an exorcism which i know people from from my background from the islamic background from catholic backgrounds from all sorts of different backgrounds who have been taken yeah. for these uh ceremonies against their will right and i i see nothing wrong with doing something like that if it's entirely within the choice of the person doing it and i don't doubt that you know maybe there are circumstances with that where that is relevant uh, i don't think clinical mental illness is one of those circumstances uh 
And I think it's really, really important in order to protect people who are in vulnerable states. You know, there's right now I'm with it to the point that I could choose my own treatment, but there was a point in time where I was so far gone from reality that it wasn't up to me what my treatment was. Uh, so I encourage people as much as possible to plan those, those who are living with mental health, serious mental health conditions that might require hospitalizations to be clear about the people they wanna be involved, to be clear about the places that they would or wouldn't wanna go, the treatments that they would or would not uh, want to uh, have used on them <laughs> or, or yeah. be a part. Uh, and I know one of the things, and I, I never had an electroconvulsive therapy, formerly known as electroshock therapy and formerly done very differently than it's done today. I have never had it. I have seen miracles happen with it. And I know there's a lot of stigma associated with that treatment. Uh, and I know some people in their plans, one of their uh, prerequisites is I, I would never do electroconvulsive therapy. And that's entirely fine. But I think it's important to be aware of what all the available therapies are and that there are very effective therapies that have a lot of stigma associated with them. Uh, and to this point, in terms of medications, we're not sure why, which medications work, even though they have commercials telling you that like, oh, this happens. And then we're not yeah. sure, we're still not sure what the original uh, etiology is when it comes to bipolar, right? Unless there are a few cases where, you know, it's thyroid related or something else. Uh, but generally you don't know what that is. We don't know that yet. So once we start figuring that out, hopefully things will change, but until then we need to be able to have a greater say in our own care. Uh, and the only way to do that when we are in the midst of psychosis or something like that is to have, in the US we have, uh, uh, what are they called? Psychiatric advanced directives. Uh, and other countries have different versions of this, uh, but it can be incredibly helpful. Uh, and not even, I don't even think every US state acknowledges it yet, but at least it gives a sense of what your, what, what your preferences would be. And also it's, it's a sense of ownership over your own treatment, which I think is really important. I'm very much against coerced treatment outside of the most extreme cases, because I can, I think it can be really dangerous and counterproductive. Thank you so much. Uh, a lot of what you just uh, shared, I, you and I wasn't aware of it. And um, it's, it's really, really important to be well informed. Um, so in your experience, um, have you found any disparity in the kind of information uh, men, uh, you know, have in terms of mental health and what women have? Um, who uh, I mean, I don't mean to, you know, uh, you know, discriminate between the genders, but I've seen a lot of resistance in, in the men, especially for going for therapy. Women are more open to talk about their emotions and be vulnerable. Um, and so what I'm seeing is that how well informed do you think a common person is? I mean, of course, in Pakistan, living here, uh, I'm I'm coming from a completely different background because most of the population here isn't even able to read or write so mm -hmm. our our uh, you know our aim in educating people about their rights when it comes to psychological treatment is very different you know we try to use uh, platforms where there is audiovisual you know media what do you think in in the US because we consider US one of the most advanced or western countries where people are apparently educated what mm -hmm. has been your experience over there when it comes to this? Well, first off, that's, those are a lot of great questions. The outcomes here in the U.S. are generally no better than the outcomes across the world when it comes to psychiatric care, which is really unfortunate given how much money we put into it. Not that, I mean, like we should all have great outcomes, uh, but we put a lot of money into it and we put a lot of money into the wrong kinds of care. And when I talked about coerced care, in the United States, we use... Uh, solitary confinement as a form of treatment and punishment. And despite the fact that it has been proven to be counterproductive, it actually induces symptoms of mental illness in people who don't already have it. Uh, and we use that more than any other country on the planet. And 
our largest mental health facilities in the United States are jails and prisons. So we have effectively in the US, we have criminalized mental illness to an extent that not, not a lot of the other folks are aware of that. Um, in a lot of other countries, families are a lot more involved in treatment and that has its own drawbacks as well, right? Family may not always have the best interest of the patient in mind, but in the US it's almost to an extreme where the family is discouraged from even talking to the patient while the patient is getting uh, at least the acute treatment that they're getting. Whereas in Iran, for instance, it's more collaborative. There's an idea that this is a family unit that needs help. Here, it's all about the individual uh, outside of a community. And the only community I was able to build within these facilities was other people who had similar diagnoses which was very helpful, but cutting me off from my family was not at all helpful. Um, so the outcomes aren't that much better in terms of the outcomes when it comes to men and women. Uh, first, I just wanna say for non-binary folks, the outcomes we don't know. Um, and that's still, uh, it's a, we always say that's a small group of folks, but in, for non-binary and intersex folks, uh, it's as small as we know that it is, right? It's the stigma around that is so high that not a lot of people are out. And because of that stigma and the discrimination associated with being non-binary uh, and trans as well, we're not sure about the data around that. Uh, but in terms of men and women and the disparities when it comes to mental health care and treatment, one thing we, we do know is that women attempt suicide more than men. Uh, mm -hmm. Men complete suicide more than women. They tend to use more lethal means. They tend to wait until it's too late. Um, and I think one of the biggest problems in the US that we have is there is a very clear uh, suicide prevention strategy that would cut suicides, I wanna say in half. I don't know the exact numbers, but that would cut suicides down dramatically. And it's just one thing that we would have to do. And that would be, gun control uh, because two thirds of all suicides are gun related um, over half, I think it's two thirds of all gun related deaths are suicides over half of all, um, it might be the reverse of this, but over half of all suicides are gun related. So it's, and that's not something you can come back from. An overdose, you might be able to come back from that. A gunshot wound to the head is a lot harder to recover from. And I think this is because men are much less likely to get help because there is a stigma against getting help that is even higher for men than it is for women across the board. Wow. Uh, because there's this mentality, and I and this is this is the opposite side of patriarchy. This is how patriarchy hurts men. Yeah. Right? We always think of patriarchy as being something that hurts women. And of course it hurts women, but I'm telling you it hurts men too. You cannot oppress one group of people without a blowback coming upon you as well. Absolutely. And because we're all connected, right? Absolutely. Rumi teaches we're all connected, right? So you hurt somebody else, you're hurting yourself. Absolutely. And so this is what we're seeing come back for with in terms of the rates of suicide among men. Um, they, I think they are three to four times more likely to complete suicide than women. Uh, and that to me, again, is just the result of not getting help soon enough and having having it seem like it's it's not a manly thing to do right uh and while i'm at it like within i talked about not trans and non-binary folk but also within the lgbtq community in particular there's an incredibly high rate of suicide again associated not only it's nice to say stigma or discrimination but just actively all over the world policies that are so discriminatory uh in a effect right um that it's hard to to tear those policies apart from the health outcomes that we end up seeing. Uh, and that that's an important group to talk about here in the US. There's also indigenous communities. The rates are incredibly high. The access to care within these communities is not good either. Uh, and that just shows you these are communities that um, society cares less about. That's That's the only conclusion I can draw to. Otherwise, they would see this is a public health crisis. The LGBTQ or Q youth are killing themselves at rates that are dying by suicide at rates that are unacceptable. And it's not their fault. It's the fault of the society that refuses to accept them as human. Uh, and of course, if somebody feels like their humanity is being questioned, 
then depression is much more likely. A Absolutely. lot of other things are much more likely. If they don't have homes, if they, you know, I mean, we look, it's interesting to hear you say, like, we look at the US as being sort of the standard bearer and doing a good job with this stuff. We're doing a horrible job with this. And um, the there's a great book called, I think, Heal uh, by Thomas Insull, who is the, used to be the head of the National Institutes of Mental Health that goes into these outcomes. Uh, and I highly recommend that to your listeners and watchers as well. And I, I'll get it for myself too. Um wow i'm i'm all i'm honestly blown away with the kind of information that you've presented today and to you know make it available for the larger community to be more aware and you know when you when you started uh, talking about taking control of what you how would you like to pursue your journey into healing you know having that control having that say I, I was very intrigued because, uh, I mean, you know, for, for you to have been in a place where you were cut off from your family sounds horrible. And I'm so sorry that you had to go through that because uh, it's, it's inhumane, you know, it's inhumane. And how can something inhumane be humanly beneficial? You know, so it's it's something something so common sense, something which is so obviously not right. But sometimes I think having systems or having government involvement or having organizations uh, micromanage, you know, sensitive uh, issues of our personal life can become very intrusive. And perhaps because of uh, lack of law and order, perhaps we in countries like Pakistan benefit from having more control over our healing journeys you know because over here uh, there is no government intervention in any of these things you know um of course we have a lot of lawlessness around protection of you know minorities lgbtq and you know things like that so i mean that's sad but at the same time there is a lot of you know um individual control over how you want to take your healing journey so um, thank you so much for, for sharing that. And, and, and then when you said that, you know, the whole idea of being well-informed, if you're not well-informed, then how are you going to make the choices? If you don't know what treatments are out there, if you don't know the, how the system works, uh, which is full of pages and pages of forms and documents at times, I, I mean, this is just my very little knowledge from what I have understanding of the U.S. system in health. Um, it becomes very difficult with the lay person, right? Like, uh, it, it, it's so fantastic that you brought in gun control into our conversation because I feel like at least here I can talk about gun control mm -hmm. openly. Um, uh, uh, again, because we don't have those kind of, you know, cameras on us constantly, you know, being inspected. But um, the idea over here is that you're talking about something which is common sense. Yeah. You know, it's common sense. And I saw you struggling with the statistics you wanted to give or, or how to formulate your argument. So it's more, uh, you know, more, it has that weight to be taken seriously. Um, and I think that's our biggest crisis that we somewhere we in 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 our efforts to you know make things more systematic we have also given a lot of power away and it mm -hmm. has it has made us very dependent and very um powerless you know on an individual level so while you were talking about how therapy is taken in terms of the individual and not a community or a family that very idea of making person a person isolated as an individual is so disempowering instead yeah. of instead of giving them their power absolutely and it's the reason i think so many people leave psychiatric facilities um and i i take back so many i don't know it's the reason for me that i left a psychiatric facility with a new diagnosis diagnosis of ptsd that i wouldn't discover for years uh that experience of getting treatment actually caused a level of trauma that I had to recover from later. Um, and to be fair, it wasn't just the psychiatric treatment. I had a pancreatic tumor that nearly killed me as a kid. So I had extensive 
uh, trauma associated with the American healthcare system. Uh, so both the psychiatric system and the so-called the medical, the medical floors, um, that, that treatment was something I had to recover from and ended up doing a therapy called EMDR, uh, which I think stands for eye movement desensitization. I don't know what the R stands for, but it, it was very effective. Uh, it, again, it, it wasn't severe trauma, but it was enough that I, there was something extra that I had to deal with that is in public health terms, what we call iatrogenic, which is something that is caused by the treatment, right? Wow. So you have a new illness that was caused by the treatment itself or side effect or something like that. Right. Uh, and I was lucky in the sense that I was able to recognize that pretty early on uh, and, and try and get treatment for it and that the treatment for it is so effective uh, and has been for me and is incredibly effective, effective for a lot of people. Amazing. So do you feel like there's a disconnect between different parts of health communities, like the psychological, psychiatric, mental, yeah. physical, spiritual, you know, there's a disconnect. And, um, you know, like we see this here in Pakistan, it's very interesting. You know, if, they're, if they've come to lay the, the cable um, for, for example, internet, right? So the internet company will come and lay their cable and they'll close the road. And the next day, um, the telephone company will come and again, they get up because they don't want to communicate with each other. And the people who are making the roads will not communicate with who needs the roads to be dug in a particular way. So they'll dig up the road right before, mm -hmm. uh, you know. So it, it that kind of disconnect uh, creates more problems than solutions because like you said, Rumi says we're all connected. And as as long as we are, um, you know, we are not going to recognize that we are supposed to be connected and the ideas of separation need to be, you know, addressed. Yeah. Uh, and there is separation in so many ways. Uh, like you said, not accepting a certain community can be uh, so traumatic and we as you know we're not we're 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 social beings we don't want we 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 thrive when we are part of a community so at one point i did take up psychology as my undergrad and i pursued it for a bit and i was studying it and um the entire uh the entire uh, module on religion and social mm -hmm was full of amazing statistics showing longevity, better health, better mental health, because that community and that sense of belonging um, mm -hmm. is so healing for us, you know, um, just little things like hugs and kisses and, you know, making having a meaningful conversation can change our hormones so much, right? So we're built to be connected in order to heal, to be one, to be understanding of each other. So how do you feel um, uh, Rumi came in and uh, saved you and gave you this beautiful gift? Um, you know, there has been no time, and I know we've all experienced a time of disconnection with the pandemic, but if you, you were to ask me when I felt most disconnected from the world, absolutely, it would be during my psychiatric hospitalizations. Uh, so... I was there against my will. I was, my freedom was taken from me. Uh, in one of the facilities, my glasses were taken from me. Uh, my vision is really bad. After that, after I left that facility, I got LASIK, uh, which is like the surgery so that nobody could do that to me again. Wow. Um, and just the kinds of things that were taken from me that some of which, you know, seem small, but had an impact on my, the rest of my entire life. Cause I, I'm, I'm not sure I would have gotten LASIK if it weren't for the yeah. fact that like one day someone could take your glasses from you and you won't be able to see for a week or two. Uh, that was too much for me to take that that was a pause because they would, I think they said that I could cut myself with my glasses. Um, that that kind of really inhumane treatment uh, was the moment at which I felt most disconnected from the world. But the beauty of it is that it was also it was after that psychotic break. 
So it was also after the mystical experience that preceded that psychotic break. So this is all within a 24 hour period that I had both the mystical experience and the clinical one. And so to be hospitalized and suddenly for the first time be have a connection to Rumi's poetry, because this is a poetry, the reason the book is called The Rumi Prescription is because my dad, as a physician, had, had been writing me these poems as prescriptions for years, and I had been just dismissing them. And, and apart from writing them on his prescription pad, he would also, uh, just every lesson he ever taught me came with some form of poem. So I was used to that, and I was used to dismissing it. Uh, but once I had been so disconnected from the rest of the world, immediately have, after having felt so connected with the whole natural world and the universe um, as a whole, uh, that dichotomy was a moment of recognition that, and when my dad came to the hospital to visit me, uh, again, when he started reciting Rumi as a, you know, that was, that's his treatment for everything. Um, apart, and I mean, he agrees with medication and everything, but that's the way he talks. Uh, suddenly that, that poetry spoke to me in a way that it hadn't before. Uh, it made a lot more sense. And especially the way that he talks about insanity and madness. And it, you would think that he has um, a poem where he says, uh, My translation of that was, I'm in, lo in love with insanity. I'm fed up with wisdom and rationality. Um, and he says, Siram as Farhangio Farza. He literally, he doesn't even say, I'm fed up. He says, I'm full. Like you're full when you finish a meal. Like I've had enough of wisdom and rationality. And that made sense to me because I was in this facility that was using solitary confinement. And I was like, why are these are the same people? I'm the crazy person. And in many ways, yes, I was the crazy person. But you have put me into a system that is a million times crazier than any of us who are in the system. So your way of treating me is actually crazier than my own treatment. And that was when I really connected with Rumi's poetry because I, I knew that there was something uh, valuable to, to understanding the distinction between uh, truth and fiction and also madness uh, and sanity. <laughs> Wow. Uh, wow. So intense. And you have a real grace, uh, you know, when you share these these moments. I mean, for me, they're really intense and um, they're so touching because I think that when we are, you know, so truthful and so honest with our narratives that there's no sugarcoating and there's no euphemism and we come out with it as it is. It, it it is so real that it touches a real part of the one who's listening, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and it gives that permission for others to also share their truth and and be real. So thank you so much for doing that. You know, when you 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 were you're explaining and you were using the vocabulary where you said the word insane, insanity, crazy, mad. And I was thinking, who isn't? Who yeah. isn't? We are all on a spectrum where we're we're different from the other in some way or the other. And that lack of, I mean, we are all humans, but we're all so unique and different that our differences make us feel like the, the other person doesn't understand me, right? And that's become the core problem in the world today that we don't feel understood. And... Mm -hmm. When we don't feel understood, that's when we feel isolated. Like, I'm probably the only one who's thinking these thoughts. I'm probably the only one who's experiencing this experience. So I am the crazy one, you know. I am okay. mad and the rest of them are sane, while nobody is actually sane, right. you know. <laughs> so, you know, we're, we're, we're all in some way or the other eccentric, different. The only difference is that some people choose to be their true selves and show their individual unique craziness while others are too shy or are not confident enough to, to be their real self. And over here, I, uh, I'm really inspired to share uh, something that I learned from Rumi because I did a very scholarly 
course in Rumi's work. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he uses this verse from the Quran where he talks about and God said, am I not your Lord? And uh, we said, yes, and um, you know, my teachers say that when Insan said bala, he took a bala on himself, you know, like a calamity uh, by taking that responsibility by saying yes. And Rumi says that when God is asking you, am I not your Lord? It's you saying yes to your calling in this life. What were you meant to manifest? Which name of God have you got hidden in your heart? that you will bring into this world and manifest, which is going to be wahid and ahad. It's going to be unique. It's just going to be your light. It's just going to be your shine that you've got to shine here. And in doing that, because your light is just going to be so unique, you'll feel alone and crazy. Mm -hmm. And to do that, you'll need faith and God is saying, am I not your Lord? So the word is rub, you know, the one who nourishes and, takes a seed and makes it into a tree. So, you know, if one is like, I'm like Fatma and I'm like Fa tree of Fatma, right? There's no tree of Fatma ever going to be before or after me. So I'm going to be alone because I'm so unique. Mm -hmm. And I need faith and I need that God holding my hand and saying, I'm, I've got your back, you know, I'll take you from a seed and I'll make you into a tree. So I feel like the whole idea of craziness has to be flipped into a narrative yeah. of empowering us rather than disempowering us into feeling like something is wrong. Um, yeah. And that's where I, I think Rumi accepts this, the notion hands down that all of us are crazy. Uh, that's where we begin and we have a choice similar to what you were talking about. Our choice is to uh, that madness can come out of two things. It can come out of love and it can come out of fear. And when it comes out of love, it creates a mystic. And when it comes out of fear, it creates a lunatic. Uh, and more specifically in, in the faith realm creates a fundamentalist. Wow. Uh, and I think is, is really interesting because those mystics and those fundamentalists ultimately have a lot in common. And if they could just meet in the middle and be like, okay, what you're you're working with the same madness we're working with, your response to it is just fear. Our response to it is love. Uh, love makes for a better life. Love makes for uh, less violence uh, in our own hearts and in the world. You know, it's just, it's frustrating. And you talk about people feeling like they're not being seen uh, or understood. And I think that's so wise and so true that so many people just feel like, feel victimized in one way or another. Uh, and it's easy to say, well, you're not a victim, Wh where, whatever that person's background might be, you know, they might have every privilege in the world and yet they feel victimized. Uh, is it better to tell that person, are you crazy? Like you, you're, of course, you're not a victim, right? Everyone else who you're people you're oppressing, right? Think of an oppressor, uh, is the victim. I'm not sure that changes that oppressor's mind, but I think at least hearing a person out, even if what they're saying is just wildly irrational, um, makes you makes them feel like they're heard and opens a door for to choose love instead of fear when it comes to how to express the madness that lives within all of us. Absolutely! Wow. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm. I'm blown away by by that explanation that you give the difference between how uh, how someone who experiences mysticism through love and someone who experiences it through fear because um almost I mean in the past 10 years my journey's been um you know understanding the difference between living out of fear which is what I was conditioned and brought up with when it came to god and punishments and fear and to take that journey from fear to love and finding the God of love. And there's a beautiful hadith which says, I am in the opinion of my servant. So if you choose fear, that's who you're becoming. And if you choose love, that's who you're becoming. And uh, and that's the God you are, are going to be with, you know. 
that's the that's the that that's what you're creating for yourself so um you know uh, one of my teachers said that you know the preferred way in mysticism is the path of jesus you know muhammad always uh emphasized that the path to god should be the path of jesus because it's a path of love you know it's a path of acceptance it's a path of you know being being connected uh, uh you know wanting to heal uh the world rather than you know so um in uh you know in uh, um in punjabi uh, in pakistan we have one of the dialects and we have this saying which, which translates as uh god running after your jannat your heaven i have made my world into a hell you know mm -hmm. yeah so it's like if if we're so selfish you know then i actually wonder how amazing an atheist would be because an atheist who does good uh, does good out of no no uh you know compensation they're, they're not waiting to for a heaven or any goodies or any you know rewards they're just doing it because goodness feels right to be good and do good you know so being able to come to that place of asking the right questions and going deeper into our humanity and saying do i do i really want to worship a god who fills me with fear who's constantly angry with me who's so sensitive to every mistake i make uh would i ever want to be close to that god while the quran is saying that i'm closer to you than your jugular vein you know mm -hmm. while every verse is beginning with i am the merciful i am the loving i'm the compassionate you know how how do you reconcile Yeah. And I think that for me, that was the journey, asking the right questions and allowing myself to be the crazy one, to ask yeah. my questions, to say that while the whole world might be believing in something, I still need my answers because it doesn't make sense to me. And just because everyone is doing it, it is not my answer, you know? So in that sense, I think that someone uh, who will be well-informed um you know and who goes on that journey automatically becomes crazy yeah. and you got to be brave enough to stay that way so you don't lose yourself because you know like i mentioned when i was studying psychology there was a line there which said the 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 extent of depression a person experiences is the amount of distance they're living away from their true self mm -hmm. So the more we are disconnected with who we truly authentically are will determine the amount of depression we experience. And there can be so many factors that can contribute towards that way of living. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'm glad you brought up the, the first verse of every surah is the same I think there's only one surah that doesn't begin that way and I think it was just an accident <laughs> like somebody forgot to include it um is the, God the most gracious the most merciful and I'll never forget having a friend who uh someone very close in her family had died by suicide and her immediate instinct at the time she was a person of faith unfortunately but her, for her her path is that she's an atheist at this point Um, and I think that had a lot to do with it, but at the time she, her biggest worry was that, uh, her brother would go to hell. That was the number one worry for her. And that to me struck me as like, not even a close to a worry, because obviously this had just happened after an intense pain for him. Um, and generally, you know, suicide is not a choice for most people, it's a, the result of an untreated mental health condition, uh, which he certainly had. So I, my response to her was like, if God is the most gracious, the most merciful, like, don't you think he's as gracious and merciful as you? Like yeah. you, you would, you would let your brother into heaven, right? Yeah. So yeah. you would like, it's a kind of, uh, narcissism to think that God wouldn't have grace and mercy that's greater than even yours you know yeah. and you think about the person you know who is the greatest uh mercy and the greatest grace uh and it's it's pretty comforting because that person like if that person were in charge 
of the future of my soul, I'm fine. And to realize that God's mercy and God's grace is just so many times more than that one person who, you know, who is, you know, the most ethical, the most perfect person uh, in your life. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So I usually say that, you know, there's a lot of uh, goodness there there's a gift hidden in 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 scriptures in religious um, you know information for all of us don't rely on the gatekeepers you know don't rely on the gatekeepers because what they're giving you may not be the real thing go and get your treasure yourself you know um, and unfortunately the people who've taken the reins of religion in their hands have portrayed a god uh, where you can't even find that amount of humanity in God that you can even find in a in a normal lay human being, and um, so that's why I feel like um, if 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 that kind of God doesn't make sense, and if that kind of God uh, you're not comfortable with, then go find the God you'd want to worship you know, so that you, you don't have to be forced to worship that God, you want to worship, you know, some, a God that makes sense. And for me, my journey started when I had my kids. And I just thought, you know, my mom and my dad, the way they brought me up, I turned out pretty okay. So I'll just do whatever they did. And it just didn't work uh, with my kids. And so I went on a journey of reading one parenting book after another, trying to figure out how to be a mom, uh, no, there, there is no this thing of, you know, mom knows best kind of magic. I did not feel it ever. I think I had to be constantly reading and educating myself to be a better parent. And there was so much unlearning to do. And one of my uh, turning points was where, you know, I, I read um, Laura Markham a lot. And she would say that punishment uh, does not help it's not growth centric. It doesn't bring out a good outcome in training kids. Punishment doesn't work. Children just have to learn from their own consequences, but imposed punishment has only detrimental effects. Yeah. And I'm thinking we have that hadith that God loves you more than 70 mothers. Mm -hmm. Right. And as a mother, if I understand that I don't want to punish my child, how can God be okay with punishing? Yeah. Right. And I was just, I was just stuck with that inquiry. And I was just like, I need to get an answer to that. So for a while, I put the Quran away and I said, it's not making sense to me. Um, I believed in it and I, and I prayed and I said, I want the right teacher who could open this book for me and make sense because it doesn't make sense. And the same goes with gender issues in the Quran, you know, that need to be reinterpreted and reanalyzed because there's a whole lot that we generally don't, um, uh, you know, uh, address. So, so much changes when you are honestly asking the right questions and allow yourself to take up that space where you don't feel too much. Mm -hmm. And you say but this is my question and it's very valid. You know, like, I mean, just as a teaser, you know, when you look at the story of Adam and Eve, um, God says I made Adam for, for being a representative on earth. Mm -hmm. And yet he puts Adam into heaven. And it's, it's, the, it's the Satan who completes God's plan in sending Adam to earth, which was the original plan. So you kind of wonder what's going on over here. And generally, we wouldn't have the space to ask these questions in a religious environment. It's considered blasphemous. It's considered disrespectful. But these are genuine questions. And if we don't allow uh, the space to ask the right questions, then question marks will only lead to something like what you said, that you know your friend going into atheism because you are taking away the right to understand God, taking away the right to understand love and beauty, you know. So, yeah. so please now, uh, if I can request you to uh, share 
something that is really precious to you from this book, uh, Rumi Prescription. Um, maybe a portion of the book if you'd like to read or any couplets or something that you connect with. Yeah. Um, let me see if the portion that has the couplet that I would want to share with y'all is a... Because interestingly, I uh, I kind of heard your book on um uh, an audiobook and okay. i would uh, i would enjoy hearing the the farsi you know the persian uh, uh i think it was the way it was being narrated and you know the way uh, the dialogues were being said it just immersed me so much i felt like i lived through that book huh. um so you know what i'm going to read a portion that part of it was, um, unfortunately, uh, and this this doesn't. I'll, I'll tell you the poem first, and then I'll read you a portion from the book because the book itself is mostly memoir, and that is something that I, I'm not sure people realize. It's a, it's each chapter is broken down to, into a different diagnosis and prescription. Uh, and within those chapters, I deeply, the way Rumi's poetry is, is you can spend your life interpreting one couplet. <laughs> like, uh, so these are the couplets that have really infused my life that have been the couplets that my dad has recited to me over and over again over, over the years. Uh, and so those are the couplets we end up focusing on, uh, the ones that spoke to him the most and the ones he recited to me the most. Uh, and so this portion of it, uh, I think there's a reference to the Baha'i faith uh, in it. And for those who are unfamiliar with the Baha'i faith, it's a faith that originated in Iran. Um, it's a very peace-loving faith, and I encourage you to learn a little bit more about it. But Baha'is are extremely persecuted in Iran, partly because they accept the Prophet Muhammad, and they also accept a prophet that came after, for them, Baha'u'llah. Uh, and so... I've really simplified that. Um, you should talk to an actual Baha'i to get a better description of it or even better read the Baha'i text. Uh, but anyway, it's important to me to say that this was, the, the book was recently um, translated into Farsi. This is Dar Mongadia Molana. Uh, and it's now in its second printing in Iran, which is, I'm very excited about. Uh, but unfortunately, there was some censorship that had to go on. So I'm going to read parts of it that were censored. <laughs> Uh, and only this part, they took out the Baha'i portion, which is why I want you to sp pay special attention to that reference, uh, because I, I really wish it had not been taken out. This is a faith that was born in Iran that we should be proud of as Iranians. Um, all right. Uh, the poem, first off, is Zar talab gashti khud aval zar budi. Yani, my translation is you went out in search of gold far and wide, but all along you were gold on the inside. And I think that's a poem that appeals to me as a seeker because it sort of slows me down and makes me realize I already have all the things that I need, um, which is why, you know, it's not a great selling point for a book when you say like, you have everything you want. <laughs> like, I'm not, I'm not a good salesperson. I hope the book is useful to people, but ultimately you don't need a book. You don't need me. You don't need a podcast. You don't need the internet. You don't need anything because the beloved lives within you and part of the room reason I think Rumi's poetry is so transcendent is because the majority of it is in Farsi uh when there's some Arabic he might pull directly from the Quran or he'll translate into Farsi from the Quran uh Farsi does not have gender so there is no wow. he or she in in Farsi so the beloved is not gendered and the danger of gendering something as important and big as the beloved is huge. And of course, it's going to be gendered in the way that whatever cultural society would view something that big uh, if you're using he or she. And ultimately, in the trans in the book, whenever I refer to the beloved, uh, I use a capital B. We don't really have capitals in the same way in Farsi, but I use a capital B. And I always refer to the beloved as it uh, with a capital I. Uh, because you've got to think this this God must be above and beyond the concept of gender. And I think that's partly why uh, Rumi's poetry works so well, is that gender never comes into it when it comes to the beloved. So, um, and he has a whole portion of 
there's a part in the Mass Navi where he actively says uh, that woman is creator, like woman is creative uh, in a way that really holds women up. Uh, that plenty of scholars have thoroughly investigated, but he calls woman a ray of the a ray of light, uh, and she is uh, not the creator. I think I think I'm, I might be mistranslating, but he's but the creative, um, and that there's a power and a beauty in that. So this is the portion I wanted to read. It's on page I think five. I pulled it up on. Who's early on? Here we go. All right. Nearly every lesson Ahmed, I call my dad Ahmed. That's his first name. I've always called him that. So, uh, and yes, he's my biological father. So <laughs> nearly, nearly every lesson, people always ask, nearly every lesson Ahmed has ever taught me has been accompanied by a poem, recited always with love, regularly from Rumi and often by heart. It is part habit, part inheritance. Mm, this isn't it. Sorry. I, I don't think this is the, this is the, hold on a second. I want to read you the, the perfect section. Yeah. Uh, I, I, had, I had intentionally looked at Baha'is and that was where I thought it was, but I don't think it is. Um, Do this it, part maybe you, you can edit. <laughs> yeah. Do you have the Kindle? You can just search a Baha'i. I do. I have the searchable one here. Okay. Um, Christian teaching. There we go. I found it. All right. So it's wow. actually on page 73. Okay. Sorry about that. No worries. I was like, as it, I was like, is it really that early in the book? But this is uh, a portion that I think will speak to you. Uh, in particular, which is why I chose it. So actually on page 73, though my father's literary lessons have always revolved around Rumi and poetry, I realize upon leaving California that they have never in fact been about either. Rather, they are and always have been about prayer. Not the kind that requires a temple or a church or a mosque, but the kind that requires a soul and nothing more. A devotion that supersedes religion while sustaining faith, singing of love through countless incomparable melodies. It underlies the Christian teaching that the kingdom of God is within you, the Zoroastrian teaching that the divine can be found inside your own heart, the Sikh teaching that the Lord lies within you like the fragrance in a flower or the reflection in a mirror, the Buddhist teaching that enlightenment relies upon awakening to a condition that already awaits within. The Baha'i teaching that you can find God standing within you by turning your sights inward. The Hindu teaching that curbing your mind can reveal the almighty within your heart. The Jewish teaching that the Lord's candle shines inside your soul. And the Islamic teaching that the beloved is nearer to you than your jugular vein. Wow. Well, it is this Quranic teaching with which Rumi, my father, and I are most familiar as Muslims. Every one of these parallel revelations resonates in the same ecstatic key, all part of a single sacred symphony. This is the language of mystics. <clears throat> the ver vernacular of those who slow down to speed up who bow down to rise up, whose only rush is in seeking the beloved within. And it is everyone's native tongue. So, oh. well, and I, the, I should have, thank you. I should have recited, there's a poem where he says, ham debiaz ham zaboni behtaras, which means that it's better to be of the same heart than of the same tongue. So when I say this is everyone's native tongue, it means that that's a language that surpasses uh, any divisions across us, right? So it's wow. it's the habit of being of the same heart that's the most important part for me. So mm -hmm. I thought that would resonate with you. Uh, oh, it so did. And I almost became teary-eyed because it's just so precious. And the way you've uh, um, penned it, it's so gorgeous because like you said, 
it transcends religion, but it what in it keeps the faith, right? Something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah and, and that's what he's be above that uh, in so many ways. But he he finds a value in finding God within a faith. It's yeah, not that he he did that. That's what he did. But he's he's not so arrogant as to think that there's only one path there. Yeah, uh, I mean, some of Rumi's quotes that are so like my all time favorites are. Um, there are as many paths to the beloved as there are breaths and mm. the light is the same but the lamps are different mm -hmm. you know I love these and I live I live by them in the sense that I feel like I want to infuse my heart with the, these messages and um, you know uh, the beauty over here is that like you talked about the heart and uh, I had a show last year where um, you know, I did a painting of the heart and I and I drew the Kaaba inside it. Mm -hmm. And my whole idea was that five times a day when a Muslim stands up to pray towards the Kaaba, one must question again, uh, does God really live in those four walls? And if he doesn't, then what does it symbolize? And he says that the entire universe cannot encapsulate me, but the heart of a believer does. So um, five times a day, we're being asked to turn to our hearts, you know, in, I mean, when we're turning and towards. I, the I would say in addition, not, not to interrupt you, but not asked. And I think this is where a problem comes in for, for folks like me. Uh, it's not so much asked as invited. It's like being invited, yeah. you know, Absolutely. it's the gift yeah. of being invited. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for correcting me. So for framed as that. Yeah. yeah. Asked or God forbid required. <laughs> So, no, 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 no. Asked yeah. as in like invited, you know, like yeah, exactly. Like, would you like to kind of thing? So you're invited, of course, because like Rahafidin, there is no force in religion. Um, and I think that um, so so um, so this is what I was saying that every uh every faith uh you know will um uh, will say the same thing. It just has a different language or a different way of practicing it or a different expression or a manifestation of it. Uh, but the message and the heart and the essence of all these teachings is the same. Um, and I feel like, you know, religion is like, like a knife. You know, this is the example I give. It's like a knife. You know, you can use that knife to cut your vegetables, cook food, or you can use that knife to hurt someone, you know? So it's a powerful tool, you know? It has a lot of good in it, but it depends, you know? Because the Quran itself says that some people will be guided through it and some people will be misguided through it. And again, we ask this question, if the book of God can misguide you, then where does the true guidance lie? And it all lies within the reader, the one who reads it has the guidance all within themselves. So like you said, you know, you don't need anything. You just need an awakened heart, you know, that is open and perce perceiving and intuitive, um, you know, to be true to yourself. So yeah, I'm, I'm so for the heart, you know, I, I'm, I feel uh, like one of my favorite quotes is um, the journey of a mystic is a few inches from the brain to the heart. Yeah. yeah. So thank you so much for sharing that beautiful piece from your book, because um, I do really resonate with, you know, working towards interfaith harmony and finding a way to unite and connect as much as possible Recently, I was part of uh, an interfaith Thanksgiving um, conference. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, the Baha'i faith was represented there. Um, and there were like, you know, different representatives from nine different faiths. I was one of them representing Islam. And we had to say thanks for something. Mm -hmm. And there's a verse in the Quran which says, in Surah Yunus, um, I think it's verse number 37, which says that the Quran came um, as a confirmation to all the scriptures that came before it, and there is no doubt in its truth. So when I was sitting there, I told all of them that I'm grateful to be standing on your shoulders because Islam is not complete without any of you, you know? 
it is just the culmination of the message, but it is not totality, you know, it, it holds within it the work done by everyone who came before it. So, um, you know, we cannot uh, ever find our answers unless we put the pieces of the puzzle together. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, you know, there are so many signs and messages and everything, like you said that, you know, to cut you off or to isolate somebody from their family, you know, from the community is again separating. It's it's not the way we heal. And in the same way, anyone who thinks that their religion is better or their version is better or their community is, you know, somehow exclusive, it's all about separation and that can never lead to healing, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. And Rumi is all about uniting people across those divisions while recognizing that those, you know, all these different divisions make us beautiful. You know, there, there's beauty in all of the things that separate us, but at the same time, the goal, the ultimate goal is to be united by our humanity. And in a world where it's so easy to be divided, not even to be able to share basic truths. I mean, in terms of misinformation and disinformation that is so rampant yeah. um, and we, we can't even seem to share the basic understanding yeah. of what's happening in the world. Um, Absolutely. Yes. Um, thank you so much. And um, uh, I, you know, while you were talking earlier on, um, there was a thought that came to my mind that, you know, when you're talking about the idea of love and fear and how that gives different results, um, what I was thinking at that moment was the lack of communication we see between the two spectrums of the people. You know, mm -hmm. this side is not willing to listen to the other side. The other side is not willing to listen to this side. And there is lack of that understanding, empathy, communication, conversation that can lead to more bridges than differences. So, you know, the willingness to to hear out the other person to listen you know um again that comes with patience that comes with a soft heart with love with empathy um and i think rumi is all about that and um in fact i feel that i'm so fond of rumi also because when i had my own uh, mystical experience which where which is where i felt i was going crazy and i had panic attacks and anxieties i feel like rumi became my sheikh you know and mm -hmm. reading rumi would always put my heart to ease um mm -hmm. and show me light and show me god's love and mercy and give me that alternative narrative um that sang so well in my heart you know it gave me that grounding to carry on and uh find peace and order in that in that chaotic state you know so um really really grateful for for you joining us for sharing amazing insights amazing information um i really hope that everyone who hears you carries your message forward like a ripple effect um, and appreciates uh, what you have done for us over here because um, I, I, I was on my mind to mention that, you know, what you have done is that you have bridged uh, something. You have bridged mental health, spirituality. Uh, you have made it more human for us. Um, and we, we need to, uh, you know, highlight this narrative. And I, uh, because I work with spirituality and mental health together, I don't separate these two. Um, I remember reading uh, a book uh, by Alama Tabata by uh, Colonel of Colonel, where he says that, you know, in your mystical path, you will experience fears and anxieties and, uh, you know, all of that. And to complement that, Carolyn Miss in her book, The Anatomy of the Spirit, talks about how uh, you know, uh, priests in 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 higher stages of their mysticism would experience suicidal thoughts, and they would be really, really, uh, you know, going through these difficult mental situations, which were part of their spiritual, you know, um, training. 
uh, and only those who had a teacher or those who had guidance, like you said, uh, you know, you weren't prepared for this experience. Uh, you know, I'm I'm glad that you know I I think that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So you've come out as a warrior. So you know to connect these dots and to see how psychology and spirituality are are more alike than different, and to bridge that bridges so many disconnected parts within us as a human being. Um, and the more we're connected within, the more we're connected to ourselves, the more we can connect on the outside. Yeah, I agree a hundred percent. And I'm so grateful for you having me and spreading this message as well. So thank you so much for uh, allowing me to talk to you and your community uh, and share my books with them. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Is there any parting message that you would like to share? Um, anything in particular that you'd like to give before you go? Mm. I would just repeat the that you don't need anything. You don't need anything or anyone to bring you to God. God already lives within you. And whether that God you identify as with a word like God or Allah or all of these words we've created to mean God and also not to mean God. There are people who believe in science deeply. Uh, and to me, that's a manifestation of, of the beloved. Uh, so whatever that is that you believe in, um, it lives within you. And not only does it live within you, it lives within me. It lives within every other living thing. And that is what connects us. And the more we can be able to get back to that gold within all of us that connects us, I think the better we'll be as human beings and the better our planet will be. Uh, inshallah. <laughs> inshallah. Thank you so much. Um, and with all my prayers, blessings, love, uh, your way to continue doing your amazing work. Uh, may you be blessed with all the strength and health and a long life to do your amazing work, write more books. And we look forward to more amazing things that you're doing. I I, I think you're perhaps working on an essay at the moment. Yeah. Um, so I look forward to reading that. And uh, this, I hope, is not um, our last conversation. Uh, yeah, but, uh, uh, but but uh, the one in series of many more to come, inshallah. Inshallah. And all I, those same prayers back to you. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you so much.